Hello everybody and greetings from Hong Kong. Today I'd like to present a case titled A Boy with Insidious Onset of Hemiparesis. My name is Pek Lan Kong and I'm from the Department of Diagnostic Radiology in the University of Hong Kong. This is a 10 year old boy with known ADHD. He presented with insidious onset of left lower limb weakness and left hand clumsiness with left elbow flexed posturing for a period of three to four months. He needed support putting on shoes and complained of easy falling. There was no speech difficulty, no changes in facial expression and no convulsions. Physical examination found slight reduction in power of the left leg and clumsiness in the left upper limb. He had brisk jerks on the left side. Clinical diagnosis at the time was that he had left hemiparesis. An MRI was performed and these are the T2 weighted images taken across the area of interest. You can appreciate that there is an ill-defined T2 hyperintense lesion in the right lentiform nucleus and the thalamus extending across the posterior limb of the internal capsule and superiorly going to the corona radiata. There is no mass effect Note also that there is reduction in volume of the right cerebral peduncle and slight hyperintensity suggestive of Wallerian degeneration. On T1 weighted images, the lesion is not evident and on post contrast scans, there is mild enhancement of the lesion in the lentiform nucleus and thalamus. No restricted diffusion was seen on DWI. At this point in time, what would be your differential diagnosis? Would it be an ischemic lesion, bearing in mind the Wallerian degeneration, although not acute since there was no restricted diffusion? Could it be demyelinating lesion, for example, ADEM? Or would you consider a tumour in this boy? And if so, what type of brain tumour? Bear in mind that there was no mass effect and no significant enhancement of contrast. The initial diagnosis in an outside hospital was that of an ischemic lesion. However, upon specialist review in a children's hospital, brain tumour in particular, basal ganglia germinoma was suggested. Hence, the next study that was done was a PET scan using C11 methionine. You can appreciate these on these PET scans, though not fused, that there is tracer uptake in the lentiform nucleus, especially, and a few foci in the thalamus. But as we go superiorly to the corona radiata, there is normal uptake. So this is an amino acid PET tracer, and uh, these findings are suggestive of a tumour. So this is a summary of the imaging findings on T2, T1, post-contrast, and uh, also a perfusion MRI was performed uh, showing no differential perfusion on both sides. And the methionine PET, CT, PET MRI showing uptake in the lentiform nucleus, highly suggestive of a tumor. Lab tests showed no elevation of serum and CSF tumor markers, namely alpha fetoprotein and beta HCG. The presumed diagnosis of basal ganglia germinoma was made based on imaging findings and the clinical features. At that point in time, the man management options was that we could perform a surgical biopsy to confirm the diagnosis. However, in that location, this would carry significant risk for neurological damage and may be falsely negative or inconclusive due to the small size of the lesion. The next options that we could observe and monitor the serum tumor markers to see if it would ever get elevated. However, there is risk of delay and worsening neurology. Finally, empirical treatment using chemotherapy and radiotherapy uh, would be another option. And uh, after uh, treatment, one could perform interval MRI scans um, to, to monitor the progress and the response to treatment. 
the patient's parents then elected to do em empirical treatment with chemotherapy first and subsequently radiation. So after two cycles of chemotherapy, an early MRI was performed. And here you can see that there is reduction in size of the tumor already that is seen in the lensiform nucleus compared to the baseline scan, and also slight reduction in the extent uh, in the thalamus. There is now also no longer any contrast enhancement. Hence, the final diagnosis was made of a basal ganglia germinoma, um, in, especially with such good response after two cycles of chemotherapy. So the WHO classification of CNS germ cell tumors can be categorized into two, germinomas, which is the most common subtype, and the non-germinomatous germ cell tumors, which comprises the following subtypes. Germ cell tumors tend to be midline masses, and the most common location is in the pineal gland and in the supracellar region. There is a distinct subtype that arises from the basal ganglion thalamus, and these germinomas make up about 5 to 10 percent of the intracranial germinomas. However, these are more common in Asia, including China, Japan, and Korea, compared to the West. The diagnosis of germ cell tumors is often delayed due to nonspecific symptoms. However, it can be made based on consistent imaging results plus the finding of elevated tumor markers. And if these markers are not elevated, histology um, is recommended. For germinomas, the serum tumor markers typically do, are not increased, although quite often there is a low-grade increase in beta HCG as opposed to the other subtypes of um, germ cell tumors whereby there may be marked increase in serum tumor markers. Germinomas are highly radiosensitive and this is a treatment of choice, uh, including uh, chemotherapy. The chemotherapy regime is platinum-based and uh, with uh, carboplatin, etoposide, and iphophosphamide. So the peak incidence of germinomas are in the second decade of life with male predominance. As illustrated by this case, the clinical presentation can be unusual, such as insidious onset of progressive hemiparesis and neurological deficits. Cognitive deterioration and even psychiatric manifestations have been reported. Imaging can be a diagnostic challenge. In the early stages, it can be ill-defined T2 hyperintense focus and without contrast enhancement or mass effect. Instead, there may be volume loss and sometimes even hemiatrophy of the whole cerebral hemisphere, suggesting ischemia and volarin degeneration. Later, it can present as a mass lesion, which is uh, cystic and can be hemorrhagic. Five-year survival is favorable at 80 to 90 percent, especially if diagnosed early. Methionine is an amino acid pet tracer. An amino acid transport is generally increased with malignant transformation. It can aid diagnosis as with other gliomas and help to locate the optimal site of biopsy. And there is also potential for monitoring therapy, although more needs to be evaluated in this area. In this patient, the methionine PET scan was useful to aid diagnosis, especially in this situation where obtaining biopsy was challenging. Thank you very much for tuning in.